So yeah, so I'm PyMC3 contributor, blogger, data scientist, consumer of alcohol. Um, you can find me on Twitter with Spring Coil, and I'm not pitching this, but it's something I've done, which is I've put together a, collection, a course on probabilistic programming. So if you're interested, you can have a look. So I'm going to talk about, can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, I assume so. So I'm going to talk about modern Bayesian workflow. This is kind of based on like the last two years of doing this stuff professionally, using this library a lot, but also like recent research. So one of the questions that you get asked whenever you do something niche in the machine learning world is why would you do it? Why, why, why not just logistic regression? So my defense of probabilistic programming or Bayesian statistics, which I use as synonyms, is that we have lots of problems that are small data problems. You know, like in airlines, for instance, or insurance, or finance, or sports. Sports is a good example. Or heterogeneous data problems, so like in pharmaceuticals, or maybe even agriculture. So traditional ML models, I'm not going to quite say XGBoost sucks, but you know, because that would be controversial, but XGBoost doesn't solve all problems. Um, and these kind of like traditional like best in class ML models don't incorporate domain expertise and they don't work well with small data. So anecdotally, whenever I was researching for this, court, for this class, this uh, talk, um, someone presented an example where he did a Bayesian model and he got 0 0.75 AUC and he did a XGBoost model on the same data and got 0 0.6. So that was a particular like pharmaceutical use case um, and they had a lot of categorical data, but it shows you that like, you know, you know, don't just use one hammer. So my kind of like goal is to talk to you about a new set of tools. Now, the other reason this is very important is GDPR happened. Uh, did anyone get involved in doing GDPR projects? Does anyone want a, a drink or like counseling <laughs> or, or some sort of like, you know, like we should have like a meet up just about that. Um, um, but if you work with healthcare data, if you work with insurance data, you know, finance data, you're, you're going to be working in a regulated environment. We're going to see in tech more regulation, you know, largely because of everything that's happened. Um, but, um, you know, but we're also going to see like, a need for more interpretability. So one of the defenses of, of these models is if they're interpretable, you get uncertainty, you can understand you know, how your model actually works. So we're going to discuss how to debug Bayesian models. We're going to use like you know no U-turn samplers. We're not going to talk about the underlying engine too much. Um, that's an entire other course in itself. This is PyMC3 specific, but the same principles apply to Renier. If anyone's not heard of Renier, Renier is done by Avi Briant, the talented Scala guy at Stripe. Um, Stan, Bugs, they all have very similar uh, ecosystems. You know, they have slightly different languages. I prefer PyMC3 because I'm involved. Um, I have no stake in the rest of them. Um, but you know, the same principles apply. So if you want some exclusive notebooks, I put together a little mailing list. You can sign up to that, and you can like, have a look at that. That's going to be what, I, uh, what I'm going to show later on. So one of the reasons that's very interesting about the history of, uh, of Bayesian statistics, like Bayes is quite an old technique, right? Bayes you know, died 100, 150 plus years ago. And it was only really when, like, you know, we had. Can you go back to the previous slide? Because you want to keep going. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I moved too quick. I, I have a time limit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, can I go now? Thanks, Slavi. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, to so to handle things like large scale problems or big data problems in a Bayesian framework, we need to use Hamiltonian samplers. These are the best in class samplers. They are really only about ten to fifteen years old. Um, an important thing that's very important. It might sound like an academic comp, uh, remark. Um, is that they only work well under certain conditions, right? And these conditions are often swept under the carpet. So we often ignore why, you know, in what cases these things, these models work. You know, we often say, oh, it's fine, you know. Without following these certain conditions, your inference will be wrong, and the decisions you make on the basis of any analysis will be wrong. So that's kind of a very important thing. It sounds very logical, but I think, you know, in the, in the industrial context, we sometimes forget that. 
Whether you like it or not, your job is to inform better decisions. Most data scientists don't make decisions, we inform. You might think your, your job is to understand the truth or whatever, but that's bollocks. Um, all science, you know, whether it's, and I emphasize the science part of data science, is about making better decisions. So if your inference is wrong, your, your decisions will be wrong. So let's, let's, we're going to quickly go through Bayesian statistics. So a random variable is a function that converts random events, and here you have random events, to numbers. That's all it is. A random variable has a probability distribution, which specifies the probability that its value falls in any given interval. It provides the probabilities of occurrence of different possible outcomes in the experiment. In a discrete case, which is on the left, it is sufficient to specify a probability mass function, assigning a probability to each possible outcome. It's not so easy in the continuous case, which is on the right. The probability density function describes the infinitesimal probability of any given value, and the probability that the outcome lies in a given interval can be computed by integrating the probability density function over the interval. It's very important that I've mentioned the word integrating, because as we remember from, um, from uh, earlier calculus, when we first learned calculus, differentiation is a lot easier than integration. So integration is hard, and we're going to learn why we had to invent these algorithms. So I suffered through graduate school, and I need therapy for that. Um, and then you do things like measure theory, you do integrals and expectations, mappings, algebra. I looked like this guy. Um, there is a really good introduction by Mike Benecourt, which is here, this is a link. Mike Benecourt is a core developer to Stan and general defender of uh, the pursuit of like, good decisions. Um, great guy. Um, um, but he had a, has very thorough case studies, very thorough you know, case studies and when he talks about things in depth. If you like good academic uh, writing about data science, it, it's, it's well worth reading. So we have more conventional distributions. They map parameters and observations to real numbers. Families of distributions are parameterized by dis different input. So, so once a parameter is set, mu and SD, standard deviation for normal, it becomes one distribution. So, so now we've kind of talked about distributions, we talked about random events, we talked about probability theory. Here's a very, very quick overview of Bayesian stats. So the key words here are likelihood, right? The likelihood here is generally what you're trying to figure out. F0 is your, F theta is your prior distribution. That's what you put into your model. That's, you know, if you have domain expertise, you'll put that in. You may, for instance, know that your sales form like something like an exponential distribution. You may know, you know, or you may know that heights and some kind of measurements that you're looking at have a normal distribution. Um, and the kind of important thing here is that if you look at the math, if you kind of run through the math very quickly, is that you have prior proportional to likelihood times, uh, sorry, posterior proportional to likelihood times prior. To get that, you need to do an integration. And as I already said, integration is hard. So why is Bayesian inference hard? Because integration is hard. In the same way, in calculus, it's harder than differentiation. And this is kind of like the, the underlying challenge whenever you're building models for this. So. We know, so the, um, it is an entire class to do like why MCMC samplers work and all this sort of stuff. But let's just take it as a given that MCMC samplers allow us to compute integrals. We know theoretically that MCMC will converge. We call this in the asymptotic regime. So it, we will get the right answer. However, that assumes that we have infinite time and infinite computation. You don't have infinite computation, even if you work for Google or Amazon. Is anyone here from Google or Amazon tonight? Um, even, if you're, even if you're for any of those, or man EHL. Um, you, do, you do not have you know, infinite computational time. So we have no guarantee that MCMC will converge you know, uh, 
in practical computational time. So we need to diagnose our model. We need to like know if it converged or not. We need to know if our model is wrongly specified. So there's a notebook at, at that link. Once you go down, I'll have a look at it uh, through and take people through it. Um, but the workflow is roughly speaking, build a model. Your first model will always be crap. Your 35th model will always be crap. Your 97th model will probably be crap too. Um, you diagnose the model by looking for divergences, and then you like you reparameterize the model, and that's kind of like the trick that I'm going to show. The general folk theorem of statistical computing, which comes from Andrew Gelman, who's at Columbia and at core Stan, probably invented Stan actually, is that if your model takes a long time to fit, your model is pretty specified. I once had a model that took a week to uh, to converge. Um, that was a waste of time, and I should have gone back to respecifying it and not just leaving it and wasting computational resources and contributing to the heat death of the universe. But you know, that's kind of a thing that you have to like, uh, uh, like balance. Oh. So, oh, hold on. so can everyone see that? I'm not going to do live coding because that's a bad idea. Um, I, I learned from experience. Um, you can look in this notebook. I talk a lot about the math and the underlying reasons and justification. I'm not going to go through this. It's too late in the day. Um, um, but we, we, we import our PyMC3 stuff. Um, we're going to like, talk about like, one very specific example. And a specific example is called eight schools example. The eight schools example looks at SAT scores. SAT scores is a you know is a, a standardized um, test for like high school students in the U.S. You you have like a your mean score is five hundred. The highest score you can get is eight hundred. The lowest is two hundred. You know there's standard standard deviations, but. Each school had a treatment effect, and the, like they thought they had a coaching method, and their their coaching effect is like is a treatment effect. So school A thought it got twenty eight points more on the SATs from its coaching example, you know, its coaching, um, and you know, and you can see the other the other uh, scores. You can see like that's quite that's quite high compared to everything else. So you have eight schools. You. There's the, one of the questions is, you know, what is your best estimate for the effect of coaching on, on educational performance in these schools? So you consider this, this estimated effect, treatment effect is wrong, and we're trying to build a model to find the true effect. Now, one argument is that the best estimate for, uh, for school A is 28 points. You can say it's an unbiased estimate and a standard error, what else do you, can you hope for? But on the other hand, your standard error, which is 15, is larger than the estimated effect in most of the schools. So there's something wrong here. You can do a hypothesis test. Um, and uh, this fails to reject the hypothesis that the true effect size is the same, eight points in all of the schools. So another argument is that my best estimate of the effect in school A is eight points. After all, the same course was taught in each of the schools. So each of these eight schools gives me a single estimate of the same quantity, which is the course effectiveness. Now, neither of these examples is actually satisfactory. One example we've, you know, we've gone, like we've kind of re we've regressed to the mean too much. We know that schools are different. And if you think schools is a bit of an like, unusual example, well, this could be any category. This could be, uh, riskiness of loans. This could be, um, you know, different kind of drug types. You know, you know, like the world is very um, categorical in some sense. So Rubin, who in, who invented this famous example, thought, and I think most people agree, that neither of these arguments represents our state of knowledge. The first argument would treat school A completely in isolation, which you don't want to do because you're giving up all your data of your other seven schools. Um, the second argument would assume that the true effect in all schools is exactly equal, but we know there's variation in life. 
So Rubin s suggests a sort of middle path. Assume that each school's true effect is drawn from a normal distribution with unknown mean and standard deviation. And two, assume that the observed effect in each school is sampled from a normal distribution with a mean equal to the true effect and the standard deviation given in the table above. So it's a, bit, a lot to absorb. It's worth going through these notebooks yourself. You will get this. My advice is it took me a long time to get my head around this eight schools. It does take time. One of the problems of Bayesian statistics is that in much the same way as deep learning, it is sophisticated and it takes time to learn. However, but when you get it, you'll start to see examples everywhere and this is a, you know, a very good test bed to just like learn. It, it's like the smallest, simplest problem that needs a hierarchical model that I could find that, you know, that exists in like Bayesian statistics. That's why it's taught a lot. So you just sort of build a model. So you get your data, you put together your treatment effects, you put together your s standard error of the effect estimates. You basically translate this here, which is like your specification of your model. So um, uh, theta is your groupings, so of, of, e of each um, school. Um, mu and tau are like your hyperparameters over your, over your space and y is the thing that you're trying to model. That's your likelihood function. If you go back to earlier on when we had like likelihood times prior equals posterior. And we're assuming, you know, mu and tau are in some sense a, a prior over your, your, your model because you're assuming something about like how scores are distributed. It's worth reading more. There's lots of examples on it. The, the, the advantage of the notebook is you get time to go through these things slowly. But basically you've, I've transformed this from math into PyMC3 syntax. So for those of you who do not know PyMC3 syntax, you just basically have a whiff statement, and within the whiff statement you just write math. So it's, you know, it's actually not too difficult to go from uh, you know, an example in the literature to, uh, you know, to a, like a, a model. So, so kind of the first thing when in any modeling framework, you have a model, you're, you're, you do an inference, you, you see how good your model is. The, and then you go back to the start. You use your, the stuff that you learned to go back to do a better model. One of the other things I want to emphasize, which is probably a more general point than just Bayesian statistics, is you have to be very careful with your evaluation metrics. So my first evaluation metric is R squared. R squared should be less than one, one should be about one. So it's, a, sorry, it's R hat, it's similar to R squared. It's a, called a Gelb and Rubin uh, statistic. And we see here that this is close to one. We see all these, uh, all these values here are close to one. So if we were naive, we would just look at this and say, everything's grand, everything's fine. However, if you do more analysis and look at some of the other things, you'll see here, that you know you seem to see like flatlining here, flatlining in any of these like uh, diagnostics. Um, the 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 metaphor I use when teaching this is that you should have a hairy caterpillar on the right. It's not a very perfect like notion, but it is intuitive. So this is not hairy caterpillar. There is something wrong with our model. So there's a couple of other metrics you can use. We won't worry too much about these. Um, they are worth looking at yourself if you want to know more. But this is um, a Bayesian fraction of, mi of missing information, and it's like energy plots. The blue and the orange should be the same. There should be no difference between them. If there is a difference between them, particularly in the tails, this indicates that our sampler hasn't sampled very well. So your MCMC sampler has to explore your space well and has to mix very well. Um, and the reason that it won't ex explore your space well is either you've made it too short, in this case this is a very short uh, sampler, or your space is complicated and has kinks and curvature and is, you know, it gets trapped in a local minimum. So furthermore, now that we have some indication that our model is bad, we can like look at divergences. And this is all kind of like built into it. So 
because I know what the answer should be for this, I've sort of plotted on the graph. Um, this is like this gray line. You'll see that this, um, this estimation of log tau, which is one of the observations we're trying to get, doesn't converge. So it sort of like hasn't, hasn't reached that. It indicates that there's something wrong in our model. Um, I talk a bit more about the geometry of it, but you, know, you can use these diagnostics. So here, all these green dots are divergences. You know, they, this should all be red. This indicates that somehow it's got like stuck in some sort of like, we call it, people call it a funnel, but you can imagine it geometrically. You can imagine like, for example, geometrically, that you have some space like this, and your, your, your sampler sort of got stuck there and hasn't explored all this other space. Because for your sampler to give you a good estimate, it has to explore all this space. So here it's sort of like got cut. In the same way, like you have, like in the same way, like a gradient descent algorithm might get stuck in a local optimum. You can use your analogy from other things. So, because our divergences tell us there's something wrong, we 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 can explore like doing different models. So, in this in the notebooks, I I I try a couple of techniques, but we're not going to talk about them. You can look at them yourselves. The important thing is that you re-parameterize. Sorry, if I, okay. So, um, in the non-centered parameterization, we do not try to fit the group level parameters directly. Rather, we fit a latent Gaussian variable from which we can recover the group level parameters. The only difference here is this like uh, theta tilde here, which we've applied to our, our theta n. If we look at the diagnostics, we can see here that our MCMC estimation of log tau has converged. So just by like changing the shape of the model, like you know, taking the model out of your local minimum, using this diagnostics and forming a better model, we're able to get something that like, allows us to do a rigorous um, inference about this phenomenon. So, Oh, okay, okay, hold on. Uh, there's not really much more to say of the note. Of the, no, all, all of the summary points I had were that you always have to diagnose your model. You, Bayesian statistics is usable, like is applicable to small data problems with domain knowledge. Um, the libraries are mature. You know, there are examples and use cases all around. If you want to learn more, you know, probabilisticprogrammingprimer.com is a good course. I know because I wrote it. <laughs> but, um, and the point, if you're, if you're not even thinking about Bayesian statistics, is, the, is to think of the larger point of not to just trust one metric evaluation. Like, too often we hear, oh, the accuracy is good, and we don't talk about other ways of looking at a model. We don't look at precision. We don't look at F1 score. We don't look at, like, other more complicated metrics. Any questions? That's me. Any question for Pada? Any frequentist in the room? You're a frequentist. <laughs> no. um, how, how does it scale uh, with, with large data sets? Because I imagine not, not well, given it has to sample from a distribution of which point. Yeah. Um, Can you repeat the question? Sorry. So one of the questions is why how does it scale, which I'm always asked. Um, it doesn't scale very well. Like, Bayesian statistical models have got better, and you know, some of the samplers have got better. There are other ways of solving these, um, uh, of, of doing Bayesian inference. You can use something called variation inference, which is in most of the modern libraries. The problem of that is that you get a more biased estimate. So you get speed, but you, you don't really get reliability. And it's still an open question about how well these algorithms work. You know, they're very controversial in modern day statistical circles. Like, um, uh, there's something called INLA, which I don't know anything about, but I've heard you know, more promising things about this. 
unfortunately, it's hard to solve everything. And, you know, small doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're, you're dealing with like two samples, right? Small can be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of samples. But perhaps Bayesian statistics doesn't work well with millions or 10 million samples. So it's a, it's a problem of it. Yes, Ross? Oh. Okay, so um, uh, Theano is being discontinued. PyMC3 the core developers are taking over it uh, until it's like sunset. We um, looked at a bunch of backends and ended up going for TensorFlow probability, which is done by Dustin Tran. Um, uh, so he basically ported Edward into TensorFlow. Basically, Google bought him, and he, he now works there. Um, so um, now, TensorFlow probability is very low level. So I've, I've had very little success. Like, I find it very cumbersome, really. And maybe I haven't spent enough time looking at it. We will be like using it as a back end. Um, currently, a lot of the work being done in PyMC3, PyMC4 is to pull out all the plotting functions. So that's like Arviz, which is a big project. So by pulling out all these plotting functions, you know, it'll probably make the whole moving to a new backend easier. But um, I, I don't know any dates off the top of my head. I know I was very surprised with how quick TensorFlow probability has progressed. So I mean, it's like there's been like, um, they don't have no U-turn samplers implemented yet. They have all their Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but I'm surprised that they've moved on so quick. So it's very impressive. So it's, uh, this, Google seems to be supporting it in some sense, so. Any other questions? Oh, someone at the back. Do you have a microphone? How you do? No, can't hear you. Try now. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing if one was to work through your notebooks, you'd see a, a series of uh, sort of divergence graphs and sort of suggestions of things to try. How how bad is the uh, sort of, or even the, is there any state, art, you know, artful or otherwise, in terms of auto ML, where you know. Or would it be even sort of just a, even a you know a too revolting thing to try? Is, you know, is the process automatable at all? And um, I don't think so at the moment. I don't I don't know of any coming up with heuristics for like making better Bayesian models seems to be a difficult problem because it seems to be very much intuitive. And in, you know, um, I'm not aware of any auto ML kind of work uh, like that. Um, at the moment, we're still at the stage that we can like tell you that your model is bad. Like, and we weren't at that stage a few years ago. There's been a lot of work on just telling people that their model is bad, and you know, therefore you should. You know. So one step at a, at a time, you know, we can, like maybe someone can come up with an auto ML solution, but I, I severely doubt it. Any, any other questions? We've lightning talks now, right? Let's thank uh, Father one more time then. Right.